It may seem obvious, but we can learn a lot from Herodotus. Not only did he provide us with a moving account of the Greco-Persian Wars and an insider's view into the cultural genealogies of the ancient Mediterranean, he laid out, simply and expertly, everything you really need to know to be a good historian. I didn't read Herodotus as an undergraduate. I was one of those clever, strategic students who thought that if I was studying the modern world, there wasn't much I could get from reading a 2,500-year-old history about a 2,500-year-old war. And that's something I really regret. In fact, it wasn't until a few years ago that I actually sat down with the father of history and tried to learn what he had to teach me. Now, there's a lot of things I could talk about, and I hope to talk about most of them in various videos. But today, I want to talk about the first and probably most crucial thing I learned from Herodotus. And that was the idea of selection. When a historian begins their research project, there's a lot of questions they have to ask, a lot of choices they have to make. What archives are they going to look in? And what types of evidence are they going to examine? And once they've done the research, they have to decide how they're going to construct their narrative. Which information is the most important? Which data is going to help prove their understanding of the situation to a reader who cannot look at the same archive? And that's something I hadn't really thought about in enough detail. Being a historian is not just about doing lots of research, although that is a big part of it. It's not even being really smart or really knowledgeable about your specific subject, although that's helpful. Being a good historian is being able to convey that information. And if you want to convey information that people are really going to find useful as well as interesting, you have to select the best evidence and the best arguments. I could provide you with heaps of detail on lots of my research topics. Lots of detail, lots of data, but you wouldn't necessarily know what to do with it all. Now that's not because you don't understand the topic or you don't even understand what the data could mean, but I'm not really explaining what I want you to see. Because of everything I've read, because of everything I've seen, I've got a particular perspective and I want to give my testimony as to what I think happened in the past. And I can't do that by just throwing all my data at you in some kind of haphazard way. I have to select. But selection is difficult. You can open yourself up to accusations of bias or prejudice or cherry picking. You have to choose evidence that's going to both illustrate your point and do so in a way that makes people feel like, yes, that's the one or two pieces of evidence I really needed to be convinced. I don't feel cheated. I don't feel misled. I feel like you've just given me the best example possible. So how did I learn this from Herodotus? Well, because he gave lots of good examples, and he gave examples that spoke to far more than the explicit facts that he was providing. So let me give you an example of one particular story and why I think it's so important to the overall narrative, to the history Herodotus is trying to provide. In the first book of his histories of the Greco-Persian Wars, Herodotus tells the story of the fall of the kingdom of Lydia under a man named Croesus. He doesn't begin with Croesus directly, however. Instead, he begins with Gyges, the founder of the Myrnidae dynasty and the great-great-grandfather of Croesus. According to Herodotus, Gyges was a spearman and trusted advisor under the last king of the previous dynasty, the Heraclidae, a man named Candelus. Now, Candelus was noteworthy to Herodotus not for any affairs of state, but rather for being passionately in love with his own wife. And this was the story that Herodotus selected to illustrate not only the fall of the Herclidae dynasty and the rise of the Myrnidae dynasty, but in fact to explain why Croesus, five generations later, would meet his untimely end. Now, as I said before, Candelus was in love, or in fact obsessed, with his own wife, in particular with her beauty. And according to Herodotus, he would often tell Gyges of this beauty, but he was unsure whether Gyges truly believed him. He therefore decided that the only way to make sure Gyges understood was to see his wife, the queen, naked. Gyges, a seemingly clever individual, 
immediately thought this was a bad idea. He protested that it would dishonor the queen and himself if he were to see his mistress in a state of undress, but the king would not be dissuaded. Instead, he hatched a plan by which Gyges would hide within the bedchamber and watch the queen undress, and then sneak out before the queen noticed him. Thus, he would see the queen in all her glory, understand fully why Candelus was so passionately in love with her beauty, and all would be well in the kingdom. Gyges understood the precarious situation he was in, and he decided to go along with the king's plan, probably to secure his own safety, if nothing else. He hid and watched as the queen entered the room, took off her clothing, and got into bed with her husband. He then snuck out of the room. However, the queen noticed him. She didn't say anything at the time, and instead went along with what had happened. The next day, however, she confronted Gyges and explained that she knew full well what had occurred and the role both he and her husband had played in the matter. She then offered Gyges a simple choice. Her honor needed to be restored, and there were two ways to go about this. The first was to have Gyges executed for his crime. The second, seemingly more pleasing option, was to have Gyges kill the king, take over the rulership of the kingdom, and marry her as his queen. In this way, she would not have been seen naked by anyone other than her husband, her honor would be restored, and her husband would have been duly punished. Gyges did not feel 100% comfortable with this plan either, but he decided that the second option was more pleasing and undertook the assassination of the king while he slept. This is an important detail that Herodotus provides. There was not a duel for the queen's hand, there was not an outright battle for an overthrowing of the kingdom. He was assassinated in his sleep, at the behest of a scorned queen. At this point, Gyges claims the kingdom and the queen as his wife, and attempts to rule Lydia. The Lydians, however, are unhappy with this change of kingship, and they begin to rebel. To quell this rebellion, Gyges sends word to the rebels that he will ask the Oracle of Delphi for a ruling. If the Oracle rules in his favor, the rebels will lay down their arms and accept him as their king. If the Oracle rules against him, he will lay down his own arms and restore the Herclidae dynasty. In the end, the Oracle rules in favor of Gyges, and he is able to take the crown. But, according to Herodotus, there is a proviso. Although Gyges will be king and his family will rule for five generations, at the end of that time, the kingdom and his dynasty will fail. So what did I learn from the story of Candelus and Gyges about how to be a good historian? Well, first and foremost, I learned that Herodotus does not deal in digressions. Nothing about this story was a apocryphal melodrama. Nothing was there just to entertain or provide a humorous footnote in the long history of Greco-Persian relations. Everything in there, every detail he selected to go into his story, had a specific purpose, and part of that purpose was to explain first the conflict between the Greeks and the Persians, and second, why things played out the way they did. What do I mean by that? Well, at first glance, the story of Candelus and Gyges and the Dishonored Queen is a domestic melodrama, a conflict between three individuals of royal blood amongst themselves. It doesn't really have anything to do with the wider culture of the Kingdom of Lydia or its place in the wider ancient world. And yet it does. On the one hand, you have Candelus, a king who was at the end of 22 generations of a dynasty, someone who, by all accounts, was well-liked by his subjects and should have been at least basically successful as king. And yet his dynasty fell, and he lost his life to an assassin's hand. Why did this happen? Well, as far as Herodotus could make out, it happened because of a fundamental character flaw. He was obsessed with his wife's beauty. 
Now, the way that Herodotus writes this and the way I read the story is not that he loved his wife or he thought his wife was a good person whose company he enjoyed. It wasn't even that he thought she was particularly beautiful for his own sake. He didn't think that he felt lucky to have her as his wife. He wanted other men to envy him. He wanted other men to understand that he had the most beautiful wife in the world. Now, I think Herodotus puts this a bit more diplomatically than I just did, but that was the general impression I had. This was a man obsessed with domestic concerns, obsessed with his own honor and his own glory, at the cost of statecraft and his kingdom. And then you have Gyges, a man whose character can perhaps best be described as eminently practical. When the king asks him to do something that would, according to Lydian culture, be morally reprehensible, he goes along with it in order to save his own skin. Later on, when the queen asks him to commit regicide, again, to save his own life and to gain advantage by gaining the kingdom and a queen, he does so because it's practically in his interest. At no point does he show any particular sense of moral outrage or deep ingrained integrity. Now, I don't mean to be particularly harsh on Gyges. I'm sure he had many fine redeeming qualities as well. Indeed, his dynasty does last for five generations. However, I think the point of selecting this story, of juxtaposing these two deeply flawed men and the situation they found themselves in, is really a way for providing a historical explanation for why the kingdom of Lydia eventually fell. So what does the story of Candlus and Gyges have to do with Croesus five generations later? Well, most of the details that Herodotus provides, the details he selects, provide direct parallels to Croesus and his own reign. First and foremost is the importance of the Oracle of Delphi. The Oracle of Delphi is a Greek institution, not a Lydian one. But the Lydian kings were suzerains over several Greek city-states, and they had to maintain good or at least amicable relations with the continental Greeks further westward in the Mediterranean. So deferring to their cultural institutions, providing gifts generation after generation, and in the case of Gyges, essentially bribing the Oracle of Delphi to rule in his favor, all of this implies that the Lydian kingdom was based upon a practical understanding of cultural institutions and what their role in society was. Why is that important? Well, if you look at these cultural institutions solely from a practical point of view, something to keep the masses happy or to keep the government running smoothly, you sometimes miss out on the important lessons that they can provide. Now, whether or not the Oracle of Delphi in the time of Gyges actually said his dynasty would only last five generations is not really important to me, and I don't think it was that important to Herodotus as well, he mentions it offhandedly and says nobody believed it at the time. Instead, what it highlighted for me is the fact that Croesus made many of the same mistakes of both his great-grandfather and the man his great-great-grandfather deposed. On the one hand, he was obsessed with his own glory, just like Candelus. In his case, it was his wealth and his territorial expansion rather than the beauty of his wife, but the point and the characteristic remains roughly the same. And, just as it was for Candelus, this character trait led to his downfall. The other important aspect of his loss to Cyrus was the fact that he did not show proper respect to the warnings of the Oracle of Delphi. Although he gave them opulent gifts and he kept up cultural ties, he didn't really listen to the response they gave to his question. When he asked if war with Persia would lead him to victory, they responded that war with Persia would lead to the end of a mighty empire. And because of his own arrogance, he misunderstood the oracle to mean that the empire that would fall was Persia rather than Lydia. So the story of Gyges and Candelus, for me, highlight the core themes of this part of Herodotus's histories. He's trying to explain what he found in the archive. Looking at all the evidence he did, understanding all the cultural institutions and all the events that he did, the core idea he came away with was that actions many, many generations previously by men such as Gyges and Candelus were crucial in dictating the fate of Croesus and the kingdom of Lydia. That there was a long tail of consequence 
and that we can't just look to the battlefield and to the immediate pragmatic problems of Lydia to explain why it was unable to succeed in its war with Persia. So this is what Herodotus taught me about selection. He taught me that although data is very useful and providing a significant amount of detail about the immediate causes of an event can be helpful, sometimes it's important to realize that there is a long tail of consequence and you'll have to trace those threads back pretty far to understand not only the practical, but also the cultural reasons why things turn out the way they did. So did the assassination of Candelus by Gyges' hand really happen? I've no reason to doubt that Herodotus, a man who lived far closer to the events described than I do, knew something about the character of the men, the culture of the kingdom, and the history and the sources from which he was deriving his narrative. On the other hand, if we just look to Herodotus for raw data on life in the ancient world, we're really missing the value and the importance of his historiographical work. He had a particular insight into the trials and the travails and the course of history. He understood that certain things, certain actions, certain cultures led to certain outcomes. And he traced this over and over and over again throughout hundreds of years of ancient history. And because of that knowledge, because of that insight, he was able to select the stories, the particular events that best illustrated the lessons that we needed to learn. So the next time you approach historical writing, give a thought to Candelus and Gyges and the process of historical selection. As historians, we have more data than we could ever use, more stories than we could ever tell. But because we've read these things, because we've seen the evidence of the long tale of history, we have insights into what has happened, why it has happened, and what might cause it to happen again. So use that information, use that knowledge, and think for a moment of all the stories you know, of all the evidence you have, which piece is going to explain that idea, that narrative, as clearly and concisely as possible? Herodotus could have written 10,000 pages on the battle tactics of the Lydian army, and for all that, I would not have understood as well as I do now why the kingdom of Lydia rose and why it fell, and what lessons we can learn about statecraft, about hubris, and about really listening to our cultural institutions, as I did from the story of Gyges. Thanks for watching. This video was a little bit different for me, and I hope you found it useful. If you did, please consider hitting like or subscribe down below. And if you've got a particular viewpoint on Gyges, Candelus, and the fall of Croesus, go ahead and put a comment below.